everyone. Uh, my name is Cassie Adams, and I am the Director of Care Services for the ALS Association, Oregon and Southwest Washington chapter. And today we have another installment for our live educational event series where we host speakers to discuss a variety of different topics pertaining to supporting and sharing information for people living with ALS. Joining us today are both Dr. Joe Beckman of Oregon State and Dr. Peter Crouch from the University of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia to discuss the research of the novel use of copper ATSM to slow the progression of ALS. Just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speakers for today. Um, today's session will be recorded for future viewing and uh, we will be providing that link on our website um, after today's event so you can share it with everybody or rewatch it. Um, and there will also be a Q&A session at the end of the presentations today. And we ask that you submit any questions for the speakers in the Facebook chat box, or if you are viewing on our website, you can submit questions via email to info at ALS Oregon, all one word, dot org. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Joe Beckman is Principal Investigator at the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University. Joe has been involved in laboratory research aimed at understanding how oxidative stress, superoxide dismutase, and zinc are involved in ALS. We've had the great pleasure of Joe speaking to our chapter on the evolution of copper ATSM for many years, and we are thrilled that he has joined us again today for an update. And also very excited to welcome Dr. Peter Crouch, who is Associate Professor and Laboratory Head in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the University of Melbourne. Say that five times fast. He heads the Neurodegenerative Disease Laboratory at the University of Melbourne, which researches potential new therapeutics for motor neuron disease. And we are so excited to have him joining us today, all the way from the other side of the globe at 8 a.m. your time. So welcome. Thank you guys so much. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Joe Beckman. Um, I've gotten kind of used to coming up in June and talking to you all at, uh, in Portland, and it's kind of uh, crazy this year not to make it up. So glad to be able to reach you through this way, which isn't quite as uh, pleasant. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, my background, how I got into ALS. I'm gonna call the, the talk, the radical view of ALS, where radical is a bit of a pun, it has a chemistry term. Uh, and I'll try to explain how it is that uh, I've become friends and started to uh, interact with Peter Crouch all the way in Australia. And just, uh, it's really an important collaboration and it, it led to some really exciting results. Uh, and I've been thrilled to interact with all the people down there. Uh, so it's been quite a while since I was an undergrad, but I started studying pine trees in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And this is a picture of one of my study sites of looking at succession. And I was trying to understand one particular enzyme in there that we could measure that acted something like the ABO blood group. Uh, it was basically asking what happens as trees invade out into the, uh, <clears throat> the plain, Great Plains as shown here. And it was a really fun project to do when you're starting out and a great excuse to be outside. And it's led to a lot of interesting directions, including working in ALS. And most recently, we've actually been doing some work on COVID-19 and there's a lot of parallels between the two. So that's partly why I'll tell you about this story uh, because one of the fun things about science is you never know where it's gonna take you next. You're following the facts. Next slide, please. So the enzyme um, that we were studying is something called peroxidase. And there's been a lot of progress that's been made. So we know exactly where every atom is located in the peroxidase enzyme. And what it does is it catalyzes uh, the formation of lignin, the, the material that turns uh, plant fibers into a wood and makes them very rigid. And that involves a chemistry called free radicals. And this enzyme is great at catalyzing uh, free radical chemistry. And I, the story ties in because I had to go into the army uh, at, at the end of the Vietnam War 
and instead of going to uh, <clears throat> to Vietnam, the war ended. I got sent to Korea, and that was quite an interesting place. I got sent to the one to one evac hospital, and also I worked at the last MASH hospital in the army in Korea. Could I have the next slide? Uh, so in my backyard, I showed this picture last year. Um, this is a canoe I bought right after I got out of the army uh, using the money I'd saved in the army. Next slide. Uh, while I was in Korea, this is where the last MASH hospital's at. And I became really good friends with a guy named Tom Bradshaw. And next slide, please. So Tom is a captain there. Uh, we did many different things uh, around Korea when we came back. Uh, we had a couple of adventures in Texas. Then I found an Uncle Ben's Rice had a deal where you could buy an aluminum canoe for $150 and five rice box uh, tops. And Tom and I went up to Maine and we spent a week canoeing all over Maine. Uh, so I've lost contact with him until a year or two ago. And then he contacted me at Developed ALS. He had seen about the work uh, we were doing. And unfortunately, we lost Tom uh, this last year from it. So um, over the years, I've known quite a few people with the disease. And um, I'm hoping that we can finally be turning the tur tide and actually have something to offer. One of the things, Tom was uh, from Roanoke, Virginia. And I went to visit him once. And I passed through uh, Duke University. I was looking for a place to go to grad school. And I met the uh, man who's in the upper left-hand corner, Erwin Friedovich. Uh, who was a professor of biochemistry at Duke. And he also passed away this year, but he was in his late 80s and it was not related to COVID. Uh, and one of the great things is I showed up at Duke and then Erwin was actually quite happy to talk to me and spent two hours and stayed late into the evening telling me about this enzyme you discovered called superoxide dismutase. And that was a big shape in, uh, in the directions I've gone. And I'll explain more about the enzyme or at least a little bit about it, but it's a copper zinc enzyme and it's important for detoxifying oxygen. And this discovery of um, Erwin Friedovich and Joe McCord, who was his grad student shown below, at the, uh, basically transformed the field of biology and it started to let us understand how oxygen is toxic. Uh, next slide, please. And there's a, a really interesting book that I've talked about that's called Oxygen, the Molecule that Made the World. And it does many explain many different things. But what is a bit curious is we breathe in oxygen and we use it. And that's what produces so much energy that makes life possible. But if you have too much oxygen or if you light a flame, things will burn. So it shows you how much um, energy can be released. And so we're inherently uh, living in a in an atmosphere that's highly reactive. And the reason we can do that is we have that enzyme superoxide dismutase that prevents oxygen from being, uh, from killing us. Next slide. Oxygen is also used to make much stronger oxidants. And this is a video showing neutrophils migrating through the body. And then on the side are also showed other cells that are called macrophages. And these cells actually take oxygen and they produce really reactive molecules from it, one of which is Clorox bleach. Um, it might be a bit surprising to realize your body can make a lot of bleach, uh, but it really does. Uh, and these cells are actually quite abundant in the body. They uh, would form a shoebox uh, if you put them all together and that's about the size of your liver, but they're disseminated throughout the body and constantly mo monitoring for infections. And one of the things that I was able to do early in my career was discover that macrophages turn oxygen uh, into an oxidant called peroxynitrite. Next slide, please. And in studying peroxynitrite, it should be prevented, uh, superoxide dismutase should prevent peroxynitrite from being formed. So in 1993, there is a real shock that um, a paper appeared in Nature and they had discovered the first genetic mutations that were linked to ALS. And it turned out to be in this enzyme that many of us have been studying and there was no hint that it was going to be related to ALS. 
And that's become basically the, the mystery I've been trying to understand is how can SOD become toxic and cause all the pathology of ALS? Um, why is it that only two to 3% have these mutations? Why can you have 180 different mutations in the same protein and they cause the same phenotype? And why motor neurons? This enzyme's found in every cell in your body. Uh, next slide, please. Well, being a scientist, not <clears throat> um, it didn't take me long to hypothesize why I would SOD could be involved in it. And it had to do with a curious lab accident. So um, peroxynitrate is an oxidant. And I was doing experiments one night and I added to superoxide dismutase and the solution turned bright yellow. So the top images show you uh, the blue color of superoxide dismutase, that light color is due to copper. The lower one is showing how the enzyme turns yellow after you add peroxynitrite. And there's a lot of serendipity in science. Um, so I had a good friend, um, Craig Smith, who I played soccer with, and I discovered we worked in the same building and he did crystallography. And he said, oh, I could figure out what's different in it. So um, we met and we grew crystals of SOD and we grew crystals that had turned yellow. And we could locate all the atoms in this shown on the right-hand side. And basically there is an addition of three atoms, a nitro group that turned it yellow. And once I realized where it was, it made a lot of sense. But it also was quite curious or quite amazing as to what was happening here because those three groups are called nitro groups. And what we were doing is taking a protein or an amino acid and a protein and going on the first step to turn it into TNT, the explosive. And there was a connection too to nitroglycerin, which is an explosive, but it's also used to treat heart disease. So there are a lot of different pieces that were coming together. Um, we realized that nitration of tyrosines was going to be related to some sort of disease processes, and we um, developed antibodies to recognize nitrotyrosine. So this is basically a, a very common way to, to identify molecules in bodies by using nature's own defenses. So when we made these antibodies, we started to find nitrotyrosine in just about every disease you could look at. Next slide, please. And so this is showing the chemical structure of nitrotyrosine and basically the color on all of these slides are due to nitrotyrosine. So the very first slide we stained was atherosclerosis and that's shown in um, the upper left panel. Um, those are foam cells or the fatty parts of it. Damaged lung is shown in the next slide. ALS, um, there is a lot of nitration occurring in motor neurons that's shown in the lower panel. The one that's clear that was from a heart attack victim, so there wasn't pathology in the spinal cord, so there was very little nitration. And there was another one that I don't really work on very much now, but it was actually uh, really disturbing and also really exciting at the time. I had two fellows uh, that were intensive care doctors in the pediatric ward, and we started looking at viral diseases in the lung. And this is 25 years ago. But normally a lung is a very thin, <clears throat> lacy looking structure. Uh, but this is the lung that was left of a two-year-old who had been healthy three days before and became infected with a Coxsackie virus and brought in and unfortunately passed away. And so I've kind of taken a detour lately and we're starting to come back and look at viral diseases because of COVID. Next slide. So, uh, this is clearly a major problem that is happening now. And one of the questions is why do people respond so seriously? Um, and why do we have people going onto ventilators and having such a wide range of uh, disease states? So for a lot of people, uh, the infection happens, they get a quote mild disease. It may still make them feel about as sick as they've ever been in their lives, but they recover. But for other people, they get sicker, they go into intensive care units, they develop cardiovascular problems, vascular disease, kidney disease. And the virus doesn't seem to be in the organs that are actually being affected. So if you remember back, they've showed the pictures of uh, 
neutrophils and macrophages and said they're disseminated throughout the body. And what seems to be happening is the body is getting revved up to fight COVID and all these cells get hyperactivated and they start attacking different parts of the body. So this is the innate immune system, which helps defend against uh, new viruses and new pathogens that it triggers something that's now called hyperinflation. And that's leading to acute lung injury and ARDS and sepsis and a lot of the pathology. Uh, next slide. The other part that we're also working on is that there's something called adaptive immunity, which is basically you're producing antibodies. Uh, and that's what convalescent serum or convalescent plasma is, that it's the one therapy of taking uh, plasma from people who've survived and using that to treat patients, which looks very promising. So we're working on both aspects right now. I wanted to show you that there's actually a connection that we've learned from uh, ALS. If we go ahead, Cassie, thank you. Um, so I've taken a picture of showing what happens with a respiratory virus affecting a virus or affecting a lung. And what you can see is there's a lot of immune cells, those macrophages and neutrophils that start crawling into the lung. Next slide. And I'm showing that same image from quite a while ago of what remains of the lung. So the dark brown spots in there are actually uh, mac macrophages that are very producing a lot of nitrotyrosine. And you'll see some clear circles that are in the lung. Those are red blood cells. So it's blood where it's not supposed to be and a massive amount of inflammation in the lung. And all the color there is that nitrotyrosine. So all our work, in basic science for 25 years, we've done many different sorts of new techniques and developments, uh, but we've started to understand what's going on with these modifications and what is the pathology. And I've talked about something called NLPR3 uh, inflammasomes, and then another uh, strange name, P2X7 and nitrated HSP90. And all of that seems to be related to COVID. Next slide. And this is another review that was published very recently about influenza. And if you look up, I have circled this box that talks about P2X7 and nitrated HSP90. And all of this will seem like a lot of gobbledygook, a lot of arrows and connections. But what's happening here is there's a process that's getting activated that basically takes cells that are sick and it makes them uh, very active and it recruits more immune cells. So it triggers a massive inflammation. And that involves this inflammasomes and uh, it's a driving cascade that can lead to a lot of pathology. And we have a number of really good papers showing what's happening on this uh, receptor on the cell that's a key cornerstone for this. And that's actually come from all of our work on ALS. So the work on uh, P2X7 and nitration, it's actually all of these different processes are interrelated and one follows from the other. So I'm gonna show you again, a lot more science than you may want to see. Uh, and don't worry about understanding the details. I just want to show the interconnections that are happening in motor neurons and they're related to many other disease processes. Next slide. So this is an image of a motor neuron and motor neurons are the cells in your spinal cord that are dying in ALS. And for many, many years of work, we've identified that there's one tiny spot uh, that picks up this nitro group, three atoms, and it's on a protein called HSP90. And that's enough to trigger the death of motor neurons. And it involves activation of P2X7. So there's 20 years of work of uh, three or four of us to show this. But we've actually figured out how SOD can trigger death uh, by forming peroxynitrite. And one of the interesting things is HSP90 is a chaperone, so it actually binds misfolded SOD. So we know a lot about what causes motor neurons to die, how SOD can trigger this pathology, but we still can't really help patients, okay? And um, this is one of the things that actually started a, a really fun collaboration with Australia that also is really, really promising. So <clears throat> next slide. 
So this is just showing, uh, these are rats that have the SOD gene put into them and they develop ALS and they die at about 115 days. And then we can take this out, look at the spinal cord and we use antibodies to label it. So the bright green is actually a, a antibody that recognizes those three atoms added very specifically to nitrotyrosine. And what you can see if you go from left to right in the middle panel, that the motor neurons become very intensely stained for nitrotyrosine. It follows very well with the pathology of the disease. There's a lot more that's shown in these slides uh, that if you're a scientist, we could talk about ad nauseum. Uh, but I just want to show that this, we track this down both in humans and animal models of ALS. Next slide. We also did a lot of work in cell culture so we could purify motor neurons and that's shown in the panel on the right and they are basically nice round cells that put out long axons and dendrites. And if you don't provide them with the right growth factors, they undergo a form of cell death as shown in the right hand panel. And we were able to prove that proxy nitrite was driving this. Uh, process, and that's how we tracked it down eventually to knowing about HSP90 uh, and P2X7. So it was quite an exciting uh, number of years, and you can see we've been working at this since the early 90s. Next slide. And just looking at this, we're doing more and more studies of, you know, this is the ventral spinal cord, and you get these beautiful images of cell activation around motor neurons that also involve this pro-inflammatory cascade. Uh, and so we have a number of collaborations with and really good friendships that have evolved over the years. And many students have gone on and formed their own laboratories and are still working on this. Next slide. So um, I used this slide last year, I think too. And one of the things that we're working on is a mathematical uh, set of techniques called swarm optimization. It's basically you're simply learning from others, and that's what birds and fish do. And that's a lot what happens in a, when you're trying to something, study something like uh, ALS, that you kind of work off in a really weird area of um, free radicals. And it's very different from what physicians would look at if they were starting to study ALS. Uh, but eventually, you can find colleagues that are working on something similar, and you start to work parallel. And then you can bring in more and more people until you have a swarm that actually becomes very efficient at solving the problem at hand. So the next slide. So <clears throat> here are some of my swarm colleagues and a lot of the work I've shown. And this is down in the country Uruguay in South America. So Alvaro Estevez, who's actually with me here in, uh, at Oregon State these days, and Luis Barbado, who I really wish I could go visit, uh, would love to be down in South America now, and Patricia Casina. Uh, we've been working together for 25 to 30 years, uh, and they're important collaborators. Um, next slide. And this shows the point where we're standing uh, in Uruguay. It's a very fun spot because you can look both to the east and to the west, and it's the only point where you can look up at the Atlantic Ocean from there. And then the other set of uh, colleagues that have become really important are based in Australia. So that's the next slide. And when I was down in Australia a couple of years ago, I found, I was trying to find an upside down picture of Australia, but I found this one that's a lot more fun. Next slide. So you can see the cat head uh, in Australia. Next slide. And then the dog's head. So I can't look at a map of Australia without thinking about this. And, uh, when you look at Peter's slides in a couple of minutes, you can see the same thing. Next slide. So uh, I think it was about 2012 that I actually gave a talk to the ALS Association and that we actually had a mouse that which should develop ALS and it had survived for a year. And we were doing a lot of different experiments and the way it came about was actually from having one of Peter's students come over and visit and I had a graduate student at Oregon State whose wife, Anne, who's shown in the front here, was our star volleyball player at Oregon State. She was from Australia, actually very close to where Peter uh, grew up. They came over, they were using some instruments to measure some things in the spinal cords that 
will make sense in a minute. Uh, but I realized the compounds that were developing in Australia would actually help a lot in a mouse that we were working on to treat it. And this was the day we realized that and then started down this path that a year later we had mice that were surviving for a year. Next slide. And that molecule is called copper ATSM, which you're going to hear more about today. But the center orange atom is copper surrounded by sulfur and nitrogens. It's a very small flat planar molecule, remarkably stable. And it seems to be remarkably safe in patients. And we're quite excited about what its potential is in treating human patients. Next slide. So um, this is a mouse model of ALS. And the mice have the human gene for superoxidase, superoxide dismutase put into it. In the most common line, the mice will go for about three months and then they start to lose weight. And in a period of about three weeks, they'll go and look like this. The next slide. Where the hind limbs have uh, the muscles have atrophied, they're losing spinal or ma muscle mass in the hind quarters. And you can see that the survival of the mice drops off very rapidly. They die by 130 days. And shown is the survival curve for a, a drug, an antibiotic that was considered promising. And uh, the NIH spent 100 or $20 million testing this out in human patients. One of the challenges is if you look at that drug, that's really much not much of a change in survival. And in fact, the mice die at almost the same time. But that's how desperate people are to treat the disease. And this actually became a poster child of problems in science and reproducibility because others couldn't even reproduce that amount of survival. And that's shown in the next slide. Oh, um, I, going out of order, but this is the copper ATSM. And we were basically uh, following on this. And as we increased the drug delivery, we were actually able to increase the survival of the mice by about 25%. And that got a lot of people excited. Uh, and it was uh, dose dependent and depended on how long you were giving the drug. The next slide, please. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a study from the ALS TDI in Boston. And basically, uh, the green are published studies of increase in survival. Um, and then when they tried to repeat the study being more rigorous, you can see all the little black lines that there is no difference. And this actually uh, changed the way that science is evaluated. So I spent most of today evaluating grants for Alzheimer's and ALS for the National Institutes of Health. And the big thing that is in the grants since I reviewed them last is rigor. How well do you think the studies are done that someone would be able to repeat it? And that came about because nobody could repeat these mice. So I want to show you uh, some results that Peter did these in his lab, and we did this in our lab. That's shown on the next slide. And so you'll see this plot that Peter is going to show too, uh, because we're both very proud of it. But Peter used one dose, and I used another. And you can see that we have a dose response curve. Um, a couple of years ago, the director of the ALS TDI came up to me and said, congratulations. And I, for what? He said, well, we repeated your results. That's shown on the next slide. Or, uh, so the results of using a different dose, that's the ALS TDI. And then a uh, drug company has actually repeated these two. Uh, so their studies are uh, plotted on this graph too. So this is really important because it's the first time that a drug has been repeat, shown repeatedly to be protective in the mouse model of ALS. Um, and it's done all over in multiple places around the world, and it's dose dependent. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who hopefully is still connected through uh, the miracle of the internet. And uh, take it away, Pete. Thanks, Joe. Look, uh, I think I'm still connected. Um, you sound good. Excellent. Good to hear. Our um, internet connection down here is mostly based on string and optimism, but hopefully it'll get us through the next uh, half hour or so at least. Look, I I'm really pleased to be talking to you all today. Um, 
just as a brief bit of background, um, I was going to include in my virtual background slide a, a picture of the University of Melbourne campus for those of you who may not have been to uh, Melbourne or Australia before. Uh, uh, unfortunately, while our campus is beautiful, um, it is very much a, a British looking campus. So there's nothing particularly unique about it, um, except for the background image that I've got here. This is an underground car park at our university. The only reason why I wanted to show this one to you is because some of you in the audience who are uh, fans of going to the movies might actually recognize it. This is a scene where Mel Gibson actually shot part of his breakthrough movie, uh, Mad Max. This underground car park was uh, one of the uh, garage scenes in the original uh, Mad Max film. This is just around the corner from where my research lab is. So yes, my name is Peter Crouch from the University of Melbourne and most of the talk that I'm going to give you today is going to be about copper ATSM. Uh, this has been the majority of our research focus when it comes to trying to develop a treatment option for ALS. Uh, I should mention uh, potential conflicts. I do not have any financial conflict to declare when it comes to copper ATSM. However, the University of Melbourne has licensed uh, the, the use of copper ATSM as a treatment option to Collaborative Medicinal Development, which is the company that is currently sponsoring the clinical testing of copper ATSM. The other conflict I've got is because of my association with Joe Beckman, uh, I'm also a Beavers fan. This was a souvenir brought back to me from Oregon by that student of mine who went to Joe's lab. Uh, and also when I went to visit in, uh, I think it was 2015, I got to see the Cavalis campus. Unfortunately, it was in the middle of summer. So there was no uh, football being played at the time. Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. So just um, to give you a bit of an insight into uh, where we've uh, come from and where we're going, um, it probably will not surprise many of you in the audience to know that it takes a fair bit of work to actually get a drug from the research laboratory into clinical testing. This is just a brief illustration of what's gone into this work to date. Um, I've been part of this journey from the start, uh, working with Tony White, I started working with Tony in 2005 uh, and Tony White was really the one who started thinking about whether or not the uh, pharmacological manipulation of copper inside the central nervous system could have therapeutic potential for treating neurodegenerative diseases. That work started with a lot of Alzheimer's disease uh, focus uh, uh, and there was also Parkinson's disease interest at the time and it was probably in about 2008 that the work started focusing on ALS as well. A, uh, a proof of concept study was published in 2010. Um, and since then, it really has been a process of doing the fundamental things like what Joe mentioned. Is this a reproducible result? Uh, how important is it? How potent are these effects? And most importantly, how do these results in animal models of ALS relate to people with the disease? Um, relatively simple questions, but in reality, really tough to, 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 to answer these sorts of questions or to generate that essential information. What most of you in the audience will be interested in is the stuff towards the end of this timeline at the right with um, the, the, the clinical testing of copper ATSM. So I'm going to touch briefly upon that now. Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. So yes, I know you're all looking at the cat's head and the dog's head again. Thank you, Joe. I actually did not know about that until Joe showed me that slide a few years ago. So the phase one study, um, that is now completed. It was a very successful phase one study. Um, the study sites were in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, the, the, the lead investigators were Dominique Rowe and Susan Mathers. And in this particular study, patients were given a particular dose, they were monitored. And then uh, if everything went well at that particular dose, the dose was escalated uh, and the process kept repeating. The primary outcome measure for that was to identify the dose which was most likely going to be used in the next phase of clinical testing. So that study was successfully completed and a phase two recommended dose was identified. 
Now, there were secondary outcomes uh, measured during this study, things like monitoring the patient's uh, symptom progression, respiratory function. These outcome, secondary outcome measures also provided very positive indications. Uh, but of course, a, a, an important uh, caveat is that in a phase one study, the patients know exactly what they've been given. It's known as an open label study. So the idea that a placebo effect could contribute to some of the secondary outcome measures cannot be excluded. And that is exactly why you then go in to do the phase two, three study where the patients are blinded to the treatment that they are being given. Uh, and there are also placebo treatments included in the study. So the phase two, three study is now live. It's now recruiting. Uh, it's, it's ultimately going to involve about 80 patients. Um, and uh, the study sites for this one are going to be a bit more diverse, but they are all still going to be in Australia. They're going to be, they're going to be in Melbourne and Sydney as per the phase one but additional sites are included in Brisbane and, uh, uh, Brisbane and Perth. Next slide, please, Cassie. So I guess to go back a step, um, and that is to uh, just to reiterate some of the, so, uh, the when, when this graph is labeled as motor function, you can actually measure the motor function of, uh, of a mouse. Uh, and basically what you can see, the green at the top is a, uh, is a uh, what we know as a, a wild type mouse, a, a healthy mouse, uh, a, he a mouse that's never going to develop any symptoms reminiscent of ALS. And you can see that the motor function of that animal over the study period remains relatively stable. By contrast, you've got this uh, additional group of mice down uh, further down on the graph. These animals are, uh, always going to develop symptoms of ALS because these animals express a mutation, the SOD mutation that uh, Joe mentioned, which means that at some stage in life that they are going to get symptoms of ALS and they are going to deteriorate. So you can see how all of these animals actually do lose motor function. There's a few treatments in this graph. Um, one of them includes treating the animals with Riliazole. Um, and, and I guess as per the clinical uh, result for Riliazole, uh, our, our study indicated that there was some benefit, but the benefit actually wasn't that strong. Uh, by comparison, copper ATSM provided a much more dramatic outcome uh, for these animals. The most important part of the graph on the left is the one where we put copper ATSM and Rilizole together. What we needed to know was whether or not, if we were to progress to clinical testing, uh, most of the patients recruited to the study were going to be already taking Riliazole. Could those patients still keep taking Riliazole when they then started being tested uh, on the copper ATSM? And this result helped uh, in the mice, helped suggest that the patients can continue using the Riliazole, mainly because when you put two drugs into any one system, you really don't know if there's going to be any potential uh, deleterious interaction between the two drugs. This result here at least suggested that when you put copper ATSM and Riliazole into the same animal, there's no interaction that, there's nothing to suggest that there's an interaction that uh, uh, decreases the efficacy of copper ATSM or anything to indicate that there's a, there's a toxicity associated with the interaction. So basically what that meant was when we did start clinical testing, all patients were allowed to remain on Riliazole and that, and that was an important outcome. The graph in the middle is a is a, is just a variation on a theme, and basically, uh, a, a lot of studies with potential drugs for ALS, uh, you, you basically put the drug into the animal as soon as you possibly can to give the drug the best opportunity uh, to show a therapeutic outcome. Once we'd established that copper ATSM was working relatively well, we we changed the parameters a bit, and we wanted to really push it to see how well the drug could work in a more clinically pertinent context. So in this particular study in the graph in the middle, we waited until the animals actually started showing a deterioration in motor function. Uh, so you can see as indicated with the dotted line and the arrow, we waited until the animals lost a little bit of their motor function and then we started treating. Um, this is not done all that uh, commonly in ALS drug development studies, um, but it is, as you can imagine, important in terms of 
uh, understanding whether or not the results you get in the animals might actually translate into a successful outcome in the clinic. So you can see here that even when the treatment started at a relatively late stage of symptom development, uh, the Cochlear ATSM worked quite well. And the graph on the right, again, uh, as Joe mentioned, we're very, very proud of this result. It's an important result. Independent reproducibility of any drug outcome for any disease, uh, including ALS, is critical. So to be able to demonstrate that the, uh, the results for efficacy were reproduced across different centers, independent studies, uh, you know, you couldn't get more geographically dispersed laboratories trying to re reproduce the same result. And, and the fact that the reproduction of the efficacy also included data to suggest a dose proportional response is, it's about as good as you can hope to get when it comes to validation of a, a potential treatment for, for, for any disease. Next slide, please, Cassie. So uh, a lot of the research focus in our group at the moment has been on trying to understand how results from the animal models of the disease relate to people with ALS. This is a really challenging issue in ALS research, mainly because the best animal models of the disease are represent a relatively small percentage of patients uh, with the disease. Uh, as many of you know, most cases of ALS have no known genetic basis. The small percentage of cases that do have a known genetic basis, we can utilize that and we can generate animal models. Ultimately, what that means is the most robust animal models for ALS, the models that we rely upon for developing drugs, represent a small proportion of patients in the clinic, about two to five percent of patients. So when you get a positive result in those animal models, the question, the immediate question is, does that result relate to people who do not have that mutation? What about the 95 to 98 percent of patients who do not have an SOD mutation? So it, it really is a tough question to answer. Our approach to answering that has been to take what we've learned from Copper ATSM in the animal models and from the, uh, from, the, from the chemical assays, the in vitro assays, take everything that we've learned there and start looking at human affected, disease affected tissue for indications that this, this mechanism related to the drug is actually present in the human affected tissue. Now, there are many potential pathways for us to investigate. One of the pathways that I've been focusing on has been related to copper. The reasons for why I've been focusing on copper is because here's the image of the drug and Joe illustrated a version of it before. The copper, the compound contains copper in, its, in the center of it. You can see the, uh, the copper highlighted here and Joe pointed it out before. So the compound contains copper. The compound is quite effective at delivering copper into the central nervous system. Now that's, that's, not, that's a simple statement, but it's not a trivial outcome. Getting any drug into the central nervous system is a challenge. Copper ADSM is quite good at getting into the central nervous system and it's able to uh, take its copper cargo there as well. And lastly, why am I interested in copper? Copper is an essential element. Uh, we, basically, we don't survive if we do not have it in our systems. So together, the question is whether or not there's a copper problem in uh, human ALS. Next slide, please, Cassie. Uh, there's maybe press next slide again. There's a few graphs missing. That's right. And once more, please, Cassie. Oh, sorry, back one. My mistake. So. These, these data that I'm showing you here, these are data generated from analysis of human spinal cord tissue. On the very left-hand side, uh, our laboratory, by the way, is quite good at measuring copper uh, and copper-related processes. Uh, I guess you could say it's our specialty. The graph on the left provides a result which actually is uh, kind of already known in, in ALS research. 
if you take a spinal cord, a human spinal cord, uh, and homogenize it and just measure total copper, you don't get a result that indicates that there actually is a copper problem. Uh, you can see that the total amount of copper in the human uh, spinal cord appears to be unchanged in ALS if you do a relatively crude assessment of copper. However, the images sort of in the middle, uh, the, the, the circular images, this is, uh, if you take that same spinal cord sample and cut it uh, across, uh, generate a thin slice of the material and then put it under a particular machine which enables you to measure copper where it actually lies within the spinal cord. These are the sorts of images that we can generate. So what they're showing is that in the spinal cord cross section, you've got this, uh, you've got this part in the middle, uh, which uh, we refer to as the gray matter. Uh, we also refer to it as the butterfly because it kind of looks like the wings of a butterfly. This is the region where motor neuron cell bodies uh, live inside the spinal cord. So when we analyze a human spinal cord this way, measuring the amount of copper, not just in the total cord, but relative to where it is within the spinal cord, you can see straight away that there are quite stark differences. Basically, the amount of copper in the central gray matter region within that butterfly is decreased in ALS. And off to the right, I've got two um, additional graphs. The, the, the graph on the very left-hand side is just measuring total copper in the whole cord. Like I said, if you just homogenize the cord and measure copper, you really don't see any dramatic difference. But if you introduce one relatively simple biochemical step, and that is to homogenize it, but then separate it into two fractions, uh, the soluble and the insoluble fractions, you can see that what you've got is an actual redistribution of the copper within the spinal cord. You've got a decrease in the soluble fraction and an increase in the insoluble fraction. So collectively, what this means is, yes, there is a copper problem in the human ALS affected spinal cord. It's not an overt problem. If you measure total copper, you don't see that there is a problem. But if you delve a little bit deeper, do something a bit more sophisticated, like looking at the anatomical distribution or looking at the biochemical distribution, that's when you actually start seeing some differences. So this is the, this is the new aspect to uh, copper in ALS that we've been uh, doing over the past few years. And of course, when we've got a drug which contains copper and delivers copper to the central nervous system, you can start beginning, you can begin to see how a drug that delivers copper to the central nervous system might actually correct a copper related problem. Next slide, please, Cassie. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spook anybody with the complexity of copper biology of a living system. Uh, as I mentioned, copper is an essential micronutrient. Without it, we don't live. Every cell in our body has a super sophisticated uh, machinery for managing how copper gets into a cell, how it gets to where it's needed, uh, and, and how it does what it is required for. So the graph, uh, the image on the left there, uh, this is actually a relatively simplified version of some of the components to how a cell manages copper. I say simplified because these are some of what's known and what's known is critical. It is it undoubtedly, there are more players involved in how a cell manages copper than we currently realize. So this image is showing some of the recognized players. If we measure all of these recognized players, oops, sorry, thanks, Cassie. If we recognize, uh, if we measure just some of these recognized players, what we can do is we can, we can measure the expression of the genes that uh, regulate these um, copper handling processes. And the graph on the right there, all that's showing is when we measure all of these things, uh, there's a collection of about 22 different genes there, all of them related to how a cell handles copper. The ones that I've circled there 
The reason why I've circled them there is because compared to a spinal cord from a person who died for reasons other than ALS, these ones are all changed. So basically out of, out of just 22 genes that we've measured, I think that's 17 or so of them are all altered in ALS and they're all related to how a cell handles copper. Okay, next slide, please, Cassie. So this is where we're at now. This is the sort of stuff that we're uh, doing in the research laboratory moving forward. I've mentioned that the, the, the drug copper ATSM, it's very good at um, improving symptoms of ALS uh, animal models. There is absolutely a copper story in ALS. We're, we're still figuring out that story. Um, so project number one that I've listed here, mapping the cellular pathways to neuronal death. Uh, it's not as simple as suggesting that a neuron requires copper, it's not getting enough copper and that's why it dies. It is absolutely not that simple. Within the central nervous system, there are many different cell types. Uh, it's already recognized in the ALS research community that neurons don't just die because of events that are occurring within the neurons. Uh, there are other cell players contributing to the neuronal death. So when we're trying to map the connection between disrupted copper availability and neuronal death, we need to consider multiple events and multiple pathways that require copper. And we also need to consider multiple different cell types within the central nervous system. So that's one of the projects that we're working on at the moment that is trying to link the disrupted copper availability to neuronal death. Uh, it's, it's a complex pathway. The more we learn about it, we already know that copper ATSM is working really well, but as we fill in the gaps between copper and neuronal death, what we're also going to do is identify additional parts of the pathway, which could also be amenable to effective therapeutic intervention using additional drugs. So that relates to project number two, and that is combination therapy options. Oops, sorry, back on Cassie. With the combination, unless Cassie, you're trying to encourage me to hurry up, which you probably are, it's almost, uh, it's almost time to finish. So combination therapy options. Um, ALS is a complex disease, no doubt about that. Um, with many other human diseases, which are complex in nature, it's common that you will go to the doctor and if there are, if there are drugs available, you might not be prescribed just one drug. You might be prescribed a combination of different treatments. My expectation is that ALS is going to require combination therapy approaches. Copper ATSM is looking extraordinarily promising, uh, but my prediction is that even for something as very uh, potent and as effective as copper ATSM, there's still going to be a benefit gained from introducing uh, a, an additional combination therapy. So that's one of the things that we're pursuing in the lab at the moment. The, we, we've been very fortunate to recently have been uh, awarded funding from the ALS Association. And for this particular project, what we're doing is we're combining copper ADSM, which is very effective within the central nervous system. Uh, and we're combining it with treatments that target the muscles. Um, as you all know, uh, ALS is a disease caused by motor neuron death within the central nervous system, but the, the, the manifestation of symptoms all relate to that loss of muscle function. So our idea here is to, to look at a combination therapy that utilizes the positive effects of copper ATSM in the central nervous system and to combine it with something that might target the muscle as well. So last slide, please, Cassie. Now I'm acutely aware that we've uh, run well over time. So I'm not gonna go through this exhaustive list of um, uh, thank yous, uh, just to point out that a lot of people do contribute to this uh, research effort. Uh, and the names highlighted in that image on the left bottom of the screen are, are, are significant contributors within my research team. And for those of you who don't know, we're playing a board game. This is a board game based on the, the, the best sport in the world, which is known as test match cricket. Uh, for those of you who don't know about it, uh, 
look it up with some caution. The game goes for five days, and at the end of five days, there may actually not be a result. I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. So we've run quite long, and I'm going to uh, just make one point. So there are a list of copper enzymes that relate uh, to SOD and are involved in the central nervous system that Peter talked about. And we were excited to see a paper that was just looking for biomarkers in blood that would predict which patients progress rapidly, which progress slowly. And it turns out the most important gene that they found um, for expression in the blood that predicted longevity was this copper chaperone for SOD, which is an enzyme that simply moves copper from one enzyme and inserts it into SOD. So I use the metaphor of a swarm and <clears throat> there's now a lot of buzz about what's been going on with copper ATSM because it's repeatable, but it's also drawing more and more people into it and people are finding more um, connections that it ties in in a bigger way. Uh, so we're pretty excited about where this has gotten to. It's been a long time. Uh, a lot more people are involved in it. And we hope that we'll have a lot more information for you in a year or so. So thank you. We'll just skip on from here. Be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. This is Lillian. Um, can you hear me okay, Joe? I can hear you. I'm hoping Perfect. everybody could hear me. Oh, I think so. Um, so yeah, we've had some good questions come in um, uh, kind of across the gamut. So um, Joe, this question came in early for you when you were first presenting. Um, have you looked into SP110 and how that impacts the expression of SOD1? I'm sorry, I don't know what SP110 is. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either. That was Michelle Lawrence, and she's got a couple of other questions. Um, and this came in a little bit later, uh, possibly for you, Joe, or for Peter. Um, how does zinc impact the expression of copper in the neurons? So zinc is an important factor also in the brain. And if you think copper is complex, zinc is about five times more complex. And I've been a big proponent that zinc's important for protecting uh, the brain. And there is evidence for that. But it turns out that when we were doing very detailed measurements on zinc, similar to what Peter reported, um, there was a fair amount of zinc already in the, the brain. And so it's gonna come down to the devils in the details and where is the zinc, how is it getting transported around? And there's an interaction between zinc and copper that's important to keep in mind. The two metals look very much alike. Um, but so far the role of zinc has not been as dramatic as the copper ATSM. Okay. Um, can, I, on, oh. can I just add to that one, sorry, Cassie? Um, oh, please. Yeah, as Joe mentioned, uh, zinc is equally uh, important inside any biological system. We, we did one particular study where in um, copper ATSM, you can actually make the compound uh, that contains zinc in the middle. And when we put the zinc ATSM into animal models, we got a positive result. And we thought, this is great. This just illustrates the, the importance of zinc uh, uh, also. Uh, unfortunately, we, we got a curious result, uh, and the curious result said, as soon as you put the zinc ATSM into the biological system, uh, it had this nasty habit of dropping the zinc and picking up copper. So we thought we had an equally important result for a zinc version of the compound, but basically the zinc version of the compound was turning into copper ATSM as soon as you put it into the biological system. That's fascinating. Um, on kind of a, a different end of the spectrum here, there was a question about um, uh, with the success in live trials in Australia, what is the update on the progress um, in terms of phase two trials of the US or bringing any trials to the US? 
Um, the phase two, three testing in Australia at the moment, um, I believe that it's only going to require about 80 patients to get a meaningful result. Uh, so what will happen is that that phase two, three study will uh, run to completion in Australia. Uh, and if that uh, produces the positive results that we're hoping it will, um, that's when the testing will need to go to a larger scale. Um, and that's where I'd anticipate that the, uh, the number of sites will, will go beyond Australia. Uh, but those, th those um, decisions uh, aren't mine to make. Um, many factors come to play, um, not least of which the number of patients. Uh, so in Australia, I guess you could say we're fortunate with our small population that there aren't as many ALS patients. Uh, regrettably, though, there actually are sufficient numbers of patients in Australia to still be able to do these sorts of studies here. So when it may or may not go to study sites outside Australia, that will reflect the success of the current testing. Hopefully that success demonstrates that very soon we will actually need to expand beyond Australia. Great, thank you. Um, Peter, you had mentioned um, during your talk um, that copper ATSM and really is all or really tech together seem to show um, some kind of a meaningful impact. Um, has there been consideration of looking into the use of Riliazole and Radicava and Daravone that's now being used um, with copper ATSM? For sure, yeah, look, that, that would um, make sense. We haven't had the resources yet to be able to do that sort of combination treatment. Um, the, pro the reason why we focused on Riliazole uh, was because at the time, it was the only approved drug, um, and still currently, it's the uh, the frontline treatment. So, in terms of understanding whether or not patients will need to discontinue their current treatment, uh, Rilizol is still the most pertinent one to understand. Um, I guess, as uh, as a Daravone, um, uh, if it increases in uh, usage that's when we would need to better understand whether or not it can be used in combination with Coprachiazin. Great. So I would like to add to that. Um, so there, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk about uh, nitrotyrosine and Derivon is actually um, thought to block nitrotyrosine formation in ALS and other diseases. That was part of its registration. And it turns out that there is actually some unusual chemistry of copper ATSM that it also would have a similar effect as the Daravon. And that's an alternative mechanism to the copper delivery. That's one of the, uh, the avenues that we're researching as well as others in Australia. That's also a really fun topic to have over a beer with Peter on a hot uh, Melbourne day and some of his colleagues. So it looks like we had another question just come in um, for either of you. How long is the duration of phase two, three trial in Australia and when do you anticipate the results? I believe the original planning was to have a result towards the end of this year. Um, but as, as we all know, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 has changed all of our best laid plans. So I really don't know what the forecast end of the study might be now. Um, it, the turnaround was potentially going to be relatively quick. As I mentioned, there's sufficient number of patients to recruit to the phase two, three. Uh, the, the, the clinical sites are well prepared and ready to go. Um, but with the COVID-19 affecting clinical practice, uh, I, I don't know how long it's going to delay uh, things. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come in from Michelle, um, but for um, just to respect everyone's time, um, Michelle, I will definitely be following up with you uh, via email and, and help to get you some answers to your questions. Um, and. Uh, in the event of time, we just want to thank everyone for viewing today. Um, just a reminder that today's session was recorded. Um, so uh, if you'd like to review a lot of really, really good information today, um, we will be posting that link on our website. Um, and just a huge thank you um, to Dr. Beckman and Dr. Crouch for joining us today um, and for all of the extraordinary work that you're doing in this field. Um, 
you know, that the Oregon Southwest Washington community of, of um, people with ALS and their family members and advocates really, really appreciate all of it. Thanks, it was a pleasure to be here. It was great to see Peter too. Thanks and thank you for joining us all the way from Australia this morning. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you. All right, thank you everyone for viewing. Have a great rest of your day.